Professor Spencer, thank you for that very courteous introduction. Alas, how I wish it was true that I know how to be in not only two but three places at the same time. I tend to be limited to one, and then apologies to the other two places because I'm going to be slightly late. I would also like, before I start, to thank you for those kind words and true words about Lord Mackenzie Stewart. And to add on my own behalf, I had the pleasure of going to the court as a legal secretary as a referendum there in what was to be the last year of his presidency, because I joined Sir Gordon Slim, the general Sir Gordon Slim, as he then was, in 1987. And Lord Mackenzie Stewart was not only courteous to other members of the court, but he was unfailingly nice to the rather more limited group of legal secretaries than was now at the court. They're now about 200 at the time the court was smaller. And he was very pleasant to us, and very courteous, and not standoffish, and if I may say so, not presidential, in the way that subsequent presidents in more recent years perhaps have been a little bit more presidential. And it was very much appreciated. So thank you for those very nice words about him, and I should like to associate myself with you. Now, it's a Obviously important in the union that is meant to be governed by the rule of law to have clear legal language. Likewise, it is almost a truism to say that the citizen has to be able to understand the law, if he's going to be bound by it, and likewise, it is almost self-evident to say that if a judicial system hands down rulings that are needlessly obscure, perhaps even Delphic, its credibility will quite rightly be diminished. So far, so good, so very obvious. But what do we actually mean when we speak of clear legal language and the credibility of the EU legal system or of the EU judicial system? Who is generating the legal language that needs to be interpreted by the courts? Justice of the European Communities. I'm going to call it the shorthand the ECJ because that's its standard abbreviation, the side of the channel. Why does the legal language whose interpretation is sought sometimes lack transparency and clarity? Does perhaps the very way in which it is created, in which it is generated, create problems of interpretation? If so, how can the ECJ best deal with it? Perhaps more fundamentally, does the very nature of what the ECJ is trying to do within a European Union of 27 member states, with 27 <coughs> cultures and legal traditions, and unless I counted up wrong, 23 different official languages, impose additional constraints and create additional challenges? And if that's so, if the very nature of the union causes, in some sense, a problem, and if the perfect is, alas, predictably untangled, as it usually is, what is the best that can be done on a regular, daily basis to make the ECJ's rulings as clear and transparent as possible? What, if you like, what's the standard at which we should be aiming? Also, how can everyone involved in the process, the national courts that make references, the community legislature, of course, the community institutions, the member states who intervene before the court, private litigants, the academic community, and the court itself, judges and advocates general, how can all of these people involved in the process best contribute towards attaining and maintaining that standard? Now, obviously, this is going to be a perspective from the court in which I have a very great honor to serve. They're my views, they're not views that could possibly bind the court. But in focusing on the court as the center of this lecture, inevitably I may also stray into making some comments about what other institutions do. And in deference to my previous incarnation, a long way back as a classicist, I am going like Caesar and Gaul, 
I'm going to divide the presentation into three parts. You will remember that when Caesar said Gallia is strongest to be seven parts of trace, the commentator said, well, it's neither true nor particularly interesting, but at least it's clear. <laughs> <laughs> and it may be that you pass the same judgment on my division into three parts of what I'm going to say. But I'm going to speak first about the input into the system, in the sense of what the court finds itself dealing with. I will then look at the outputs, what the court produces, and I shall then try to make some observations about the wider context. Let's begin with the inputs. And let's look at the linguistic transparency, or maybe not, the linguistic ambiguity sometimes, in the text that the court is dealing with. Let's begin with the text <coughs> generated by the community legislator. Ladies and gentlemen, there are meant to be agreed rules on how these texts are written. I have the rules in my hand, having just downloaded them from the internet. There is an institutional agreement, an inter-institutional agreement, on common guidelines for the quality of drafting of community <laughs> legislation, which dates back to the 22nd of December 1998. And this is for splendid, splendid rules. For example, you find under general principles, one, community legislative acts shall be drafted clearly, simply, and precisely. Mm -hmm. Hurrah! <laughs> what a good idea. The nature of the drafting shall be, that it is then said, appropriate to the type of act concerned. The drafting of acts will take account of the persons to whom they are pretending to apply, with a view to enabling them to identify their rights and obligations unambiguously. I love the next bit. It's general principle number four. Provisions of acts shall be concise, and their content shall be as homogeneous as possible. Everybody wants to send articles and sentences, unnecessarily convoluted wording, and excessive use of abbreviations should be avoided. And if you look to the website recently for legislation, quite. <laughs> to work the process leading to their adoption, draft acts should be framed in terms and sentence structures which respect the multilingual nature of community legislation. Terminology used in the given act shall be consistent, both internally and with acts already in force. Identical concepts shall be expressed in the same terms, as far as possible without departing from their meaning in ordinary, legal, or technical language. It's good stuff. And then we go on. I, I, couldn't, I, I, I can't actually bear to read you the rest of this wonderful document. It talks about standard structures. It says you should, commonly enough, you should have some definitions out there. Where the terms used in the act are not unambiguous, they should be defined together in a single article at the beginning of the act. The definition shall not contain autonomous normative provisions. And then there's an awful lot about, I mean, it's all applying good sense. Don't put things in annexes which are new rights or obligations, and so on and so on. And there's even meant, by way of implementing measures, there's meant to be a joint practical guide. The legal linguistic experts are meant to be able to make drafting suggestions in good time. There's going to be training and cooperation, information technology tools, collaboration, mother with an apple pie. It's absolutely great stuff. And if you look at many community legislative texts and you wish to play a very naughty game, <coughs> you could probably go through and label which principle is being broken when. Now, there is a reason, I think, why that happens, or indeed several reasons. When a document is, or is approximately, under the control of a single author, perhaps the problem is just careless or inaccurate drafting. When you have a text with multiple sequential amendments, it's very easy to end up with a patchwork that is incomprehensible unless you put together a consolidated version. At least there is now a tendency to issue consolidated versions. They used to not to be, and I well remember doing cases for the government where I turned in gratitude 
to that, as it was then called, for their own in-house consolidated version of the milk regulations, literally cut and pasted and sellotaped together from about 28 different regulations. Now, so far, so good, maybe things that one could deal with. And here come the problems. First of all, the language problem. What appears to be unclear in one language may create no problem at all in another language. And whether the possible difficulty is spotted may just depend on which language or languages were being used in vain during the negotiation process. I'm going to come back around to this linguistic diversity point later on in the third part of the presentation. On other occasions, I suggest the problem may be a little bit more deep rooted. Suppose there is a proposal for a new directive or a new common position. Negotiating teams arrive from the responsible ministry in each of 27 member states. Each team has the existing legal situation in that member state fully in mind. Each team, I would suggest, also has political instructions as to what to agree and also what to fight about to the last ditch. There is then a reiterative process of discussion. <coughs> there is negotiation, perhaps more unkindly referred to as horse training. And it is generically easier to get agreement to agree to agree by removing a particularly tarsome definition or by watering down the text so that it is deliberately ambiguous, perhaps deliberately vague. Now, this has the great advantage that it enables people to reach agreement and to go home and reassure the home public, reassure the minister that they have won. It's all right. We didn't surrender any important point. However, and the however is a big however, the problem is that what you get out of this process is an ambiguous text of a document that is meant to be legally binding <clears throat> and often a document that expressly indicates that it confers rights individual rights, which, according to the consistent case law of my court, are meant to be enforceable and national courts are meant to protect. And therefore, precisely because all the nice, bright lawyers out there advising their clients read the document and say, wait a minute, I think we might be able to use this, it is only a matter of time before a case comes before the national court. Counsel for the claimant will point to Article 23 and say, there you are, my client has a right under that provision. Counsel for the member state, putting as much sarcasm in his or her voice as possible, will say, with all possible respect, my learned friend, my lord, my respectful submission, this is a very far-fetched suggestion indeed. There will be a, an extended discussion. And if both counsel claim that it is abundantly clear in their favour, probably the sooner way to the National Court is going to make a reference. What are the parameters within which the ECJ is then going to operate? Well, first of all, usually, I don't say always, but usually, it cannot manage to avoid giving an answer. Unlike the US Supreme Court, the ECJ does not have what the Americans call ducking control. It is not able to pick and choose the cases that it deals with. Therefore, if we get a reference from the National Court saying, for heaven's sakes, what on earth does this mean? Unless the reference was made so badly that we can get rid of it by dismissing it as inadmissible, we're going to have to deal with it. Secondly, therefore, what are we going to do? Well, we'll begin by looking at the legislative history of the measure. <coughs> sometimes that helps, sometimes it merely convinces you that you're looking at the problem. Thirdly, we'll look at the legal base, because you ought to be able 
something about what the Commission was doing from the treaty base that was used in its enactment. Fourthly, you'll look at the recitals. Unfortunately, these, although they're meant to be a guide to the meaning of legislation, these are sometimes internally inconsistent, not to say contradictory. How that happens, I suspect, is that everyone wants their recital in there. So you can quite easily end up with a measure that says it is important to promote free movement. At the same time, it is very important to have a high level of security in the area of freedom, security, and justice. While we're about it, we have to respect diversity of national legal process. At the same time, a high level of mutual trust should subsist. At the same time, you can see where this is going, can't you? You can pick whichever recital you like in order to support a particular reading of the provision. But the trouble is, all the recitals are there. And what is your basis for giving greater weight to one recital than to another? Finally, I think it would be fair to say that the court is often aware that whatever it decides, whichever of the six possible options it goes for, and rules is the meaning, whatever the court says, is probably going to be popular with some and unpopular with others. And at that moment, really, the only thing one can do is to put that awareness to one side and concentrate on trying to give the text a clear legal meaning. That's one of the inputs. The second category of input is the text the National Court produces, i.e. the order for reference. Now, as I'm sure you are well aware, there is no standard rule for how these are done. Every legal system has its own rules and the information that's on the court's website as to how to make a reference is information. They are not binding notes, they are guidance notes. They are also ignored with depressive frequency. Let me give you two examples of how not to make an order for reference. The first is an Italian reference, which I had the pleasure and honor of reading or trying to read. It consisted of one and a half sides of almost illegible judicial manuscript. And Italian judicial handwriting is pretty good. It makes doctors look as though they print in block capitals. <laughs> it gave the names of parts. <laughs> it gave almost no facts. It certainly didn't tell you very much about national law. And it then wondered, in a <coughs> reflective way, <laughs> whether one or more of ten separate, quite unconnected, treaty articles, or indeed any other provision of community law, <laughs> might be incompatible with Italian law and that was so and so. Now, okay, if the reference is as bad as that, the ECJ is going to chuck it out and say it's in the principle. Actually, that doesn't help the National Court. The National Court still got a problem that it was originally looking at. If it's slightly less bad than that, the order for reference is going to be translated, it will be notified to all the member states and the Commission, and then everyone inside and outside the ECJ will puzzle over what the reference was actually about and how sensible it is to it. And just before coming over here, I had a hearing in, I hate to say, another Italian case, on the 29th of October, where the case was listed for one hour, and we spent three hours. Why did we spend three hours? Because both the reporting judge and I were interrogating and cross-examining counsel for what any party in the courtroom to try to see if we could possibly find out what the Italian legislation was about. Because unless you could understand how the Italian legislation governing, stay with me, periodic, vertical, part-time workers. That is, workers who work part-time, when they're working they work full-time, but they don't work every day of the week, 
and they also don't work necessarily every week. Well, the legislation affecting those people in the way that their pensions were calculated and qualifying weeks were qualifying weeks and were thus taken into account, thus giving access to pension rights, whether that legislation was or was not discriminatory via the full-time workers or other part-time workers who were, you guessed it, horizontal part-time workers, <laughs> namely people who work a number of hours every week. That, that was the Italian model. Two bad examples of. I'm now going to give the other model against myself, and it's an English case, and it's a case in which I had the honor to be counseled for the applicants, and after a week's hard work pushing the ball uphill, I did persuade the judge he should make a reference. It was a VAT case, and the judge wrote a judgment, a 70-page judgment. He steadfastly refused to make a separate order for reference. He said, Ms. Sharpston, I have given my judgment in this case. I have no intention of writing any further document. I will annex the questions to the judgment, and we will send it to Luxembourg. And I said, yes, my lord, very good, my lord, thank you, my lord. The judgment, it was an English court. The judgment began with a joke. <laughs> This case is about the immobility of mobile phones. I should explain it was a VAT possible carousel fraud case and the mobile phones have been zero rated for export and someone, not my clients, someone had been crooked and the mobile phones <coughs> were never gone further than a warehouse somewhere in the depths of Kent. But anyway, the case, said the judge very proudly, was about the immobility of mobile phones. And the judgment then wandered on and on, oscillating between some fairly interesting national law issues, which of course he decided, and the community law issues, which were, you know, the ones that were being preferred. But the whole text of the judgment made its way sinuously between these national law points and the community law points, so that it was actually exceptionally difficult to cut, to excise so that you got only the community law points without reading all the national law. I mean, it would have been possible to separate them out, but the judge wasn't doing that. There is a guiding rule at the court that now, not when this was referred, perhaps as a consequence of this case in Terania, the rule came into effect. There is a rule now that if an order for reference is more than 20 pages long, it will be summarized, and it is the summary, not the original, that will be notified to member states. Because I really would have not wanted to be the member of the court's research and documentation department charged with summarizing the mobile phone judgment. Now, why am I telling you these two stories? Well, because what matters is that the national court tells the ECJ clearly what the dispute is about, what the facts are, what the issues of interpretation are. This is not, as my dearly beloved King students would say, this is not rocket science. It's actually quite simple. But if we do not get texts that are reasonably clear, it is <coughs> correspondingly even more difficult to produce intelligible and intelligent judgments. Final point, <coughs> the text produced by the parties. These submissions to the court in a particular case, my third category of input. These are enormously varied. Some are absolute models of clarity. They're great. They're clear. Helpful research has been done. They draw the court's attention to all relevant case law. They point out what the problems may be. They are capable of being translated into French. They're great. Others are lengthy, repetitious, obfuscatory, a statement of political position rather than a legal argument, virtually untranslatable, and so on. Now, I mention that because one of the elements 
in the equation of how, my, how these two works is the intervention by member states. And the member states' right to intervene is extraordinarily important in determining the quality of what comes out. The court does rely on member states to intervene, to draw to its attention potential problems if there's something they're worried about or they're concerned that the court shouldn't get the bit between its teeth or they're off in a particular direction, it really matters that the member state turns up and explains. But they do need to explain as lawyers, not in terms of pure political manifesto. Why have I spent time going through this? Well, because the starting point for court's work is what the court is given. It's the text given by the community legislator. It's the text supplied by the national court. It's the text supplied by the parties. There is a very old adage, rubbish in, rubbish out. Now, I am not giving this as an excuse for lack of clarity in the court's judgments. I will come to that. Right? But I am saying that one way of improving the chances that we will have clear legal language and that we will enhance the credibility of the judicial part of the EU system is by improving the quality of the inputs into the judicial decision-making process. Let's move on to the second of my three parts and look at the outputs, look at linguistic transparency in the court's own text. I'm going to give the judgments and I am going, you will be perhaps relieved and pleased to hear, I'm going to begin honestly by saying I have no intention of trying to pretend that every single judgment that emanates from the ECJ is a model of lucidity <coughs> and clarity. So if any of you brought rotten tomatoes, you could just put them away again, please. I'm not making that claim for my court's outputs. Sometimes, the judgment falls very far short on that standard. It may be helpful to look at some factors that explain, or go towards explaining, why the text looks the way they sometimes do. This isn't a list of excuses, it's just some plain speaking in the interest of transparency. First of all, it's a single text. It's a single text judgment, unlike the Court of Human Rights, there is no possibility of dissenting judgments. So it is compromise drafting, and sometimes in order to get a consensus, some little problems get smoothed over or skipped around. It is committee drafting. Yes, of course, the reporting judge retains overall responsibility, but his colleagues will pitch in with nice suggestions. I'm sure we all know the saying that a camel is a horse designed by a committee. It's also a judgment drafted in French, a single language of the Libre. There are no interpreters for the Libre. It is the judges on their own, without even the help and support of those invaluable players and referendum there. And French, of course, is Jean-Claude Bouichot's mother tongue. It can very easily be the fifth language of a judge coming from one of the Eastern Bloc countries who is likely to have his mother tongue followed by Russian, followed by either English or German, followed by either German or English, and then perhaps he might have some French. It doesn't make it terribly easy to do exquisitely precise legal drafting. There is pressure towards consensus, and quite often I suspect there may be agreements about the answer, but it may be less easy to agree precisely how you get there. There is also the good drafting with the ready committee, if in doubt, leave it out. And actually that's not a bad rule if you are operating a drafting system in which judgments state principles and then apply them to a particular set of facts. I have certainly heard it said that in a grand chamber case, which is decided by a subset now 
by 13 judges. Sometimes the Grand Chamber is conscious of the fact that if it had happened to be a different composition of Grand Chamber and they are split, well, perhaps a different composition might have been split the other way up. And if there is that feeling, then it may be actually quite prudent to try not to go too far in a particular case in order to leave space for what might happen in the future. I must emphasize that everything I have said, I do not say from personal experience. I'm not violating the secrets of the deliberate because I'm not part of this process. But I am saying things that I have heard said publicly by judges of my court, and I don't think that the individual statements really would be questioned. Perhaps they're not always put together in a sequence. I want to mention a couple of other issues about the quality of outputs. There is a perception that users, in particular the member states national courts and the members of the European Parliament, who get quite vociferous on the subject, that users, users care, first, second and third, about speed, speed of case processing. And that leads you to ask the questions inside and outside the court, how are the statistics looking? Is the average time taken to deal with references for a preliminary ruling continuing to be the good reduced? If it is, that's excellent. That's good news. The court is doing its job. <coughs> this is a success story. The sausage factory is processing sausages better. Wait a minute. We are talking about processing sausages. In a difficult case, and this is my second point, in a difficult case, I really do think that speed may come at the expense of quality. And I would say, you know, using not the example of the court, the Formation Institutional, but using the example of myself, it's not because I sit as an advocate general in nice formal burgundy coloured robes that I am automatically gifted instantly with all wisdom, knowledge and insight. Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes I really do not know the answer to the case. Sometimes, for example, drafting the opinion in Barch and trying to explain manual, it takes a lot of time and it takes four drafts that you tear up because they just don't work before eventually you think, well, the fifth draft is as near as I'm going to get to an answer, so I'd better look at that. And I think that this point is worth stressing about speed coming, perhaps, sometimes at the expense of quality, because I am conscious of the fact that it is potentially a significant risk in cases in the area of freedom, security, and justice. Many of those cases, because of their urgency, because they're talking about somebody who's in detention, or might be deported, or perhaps a child abduction case, Many of those cases, because of their urgency, will need to be handled under the new procedure préjudicielle d'urgence, the PPU. The abbreviation in English is totally unpronounceable, I'm not even going to try. Now, it's certainly clear that there is urgency. The problem is that the questions that the court is going to have to deal with under that procedure are questions in uncharted and sensitive territory. They're questions about criminal law, about asylum, about immigration, about family. They are big questions, often complex legally, and we are at the stage of deciding the first cases. And yet a number of those cases are going to be dealt with under the urgent procedure. Now let me talk very briefly, and I can do briefly, about the second output of the court, namely the opinions. None of the bad excuses apply, not one. You have one average general court case giving a single judicial opinion in the language in which he or she chose to write. The advocate general only has to make up his own mind. He does not have to reach compromises with colleagues. 
driver's side, and, if necessary, the Advocate General has to have broad enough shoulders to resist the pressure to go too fast to make sense. Because there is pressure on Advocate General to produce their opinion as quickly as possible after the hearing so that we can keep the statistics looking nice. And sometimes there are cases where you actually cannot have the opinion fully written before the hearing, sit politely through the hearing, say that's all right then, send the opinion after translation. It won't do. You have to listen fully and thoughtfully to what is being said at the hearing. You have very probably, if you had drafting before, you may have to tear it up, or at least you may have to amplify it and deal with issues, deal with good arguments that were raised at the hearing. In a complicated case, you may need to take your time. Now, that wouldn't be a popular thing for me to say if the President of my court were in this room. But nevertheless, I do believe it to be important that the Advocate General, if they're going to assist the court and to assist the wider audience outside the court that reads the Advocate General's opinion as part of the essential background to get more information, to see what the issues were, it is important that when necessary, the Advocate General has the courage to take the time. Finally, I want to move on to the third part to the wider context. Transparency and linguistic ambiguity in a very multilingual and multicultural juridical environment. And my starting point is going to be it's actually virtually impossible to guarantee that the text of thousands of pages of community legislation will all be translated into all the official languages without any infelicity, any ambiguity, any error. In making that statement, please, I should not wish to be misunderstood, I am not being negative about the translation services of any institution. I think they do a fantastic job. But I am making a statement about the difficulty of very, very precise very accurate legal translation. Sometimes, indeed, I get the impression that the ECJ gets a case that has, in fact, been generated by the text of a regulation in the language of the referring court. I have an illustration for that point. It was the reference made by a German court in a case called Emirates Airlines, a case about the regulation which gives a certain amount of protection to air passengers if there is denied boarding or delay or cancellation. It's case C17307. Now, the point, the problem is this. Emirates Airlines was about a passenger who had a problem on the plane on the return leg of a return trip. The carrier, Emirates Airlines, is not a community carrier. If it's a community carrier, there's not a problem, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about a flight out or a flight back, you're covered by the regulation. However, if it's a non-community carrier, you are covered if you are departing from a community airport. Well, what did I just say? I said passengers departing from an airport. And most of the language versions use a construction similar to the phrase passengers departing from an airport. But the German version includes the word flight. So it renders the phrase passengers who embark on a flight at airports. Fluggäste, die auf Flughäfen einen Flug anfängt. And the problem about that is that it does allow an ingenious lawyer to argue that the concept of a return flight is really both legs of a flight. And so if you had a return ticket, which was all the sort of package deal, then it's really much better if you get protection for both legs of the flight. And I certainly took the view of the opinion that really the problem seems, at least in part, to stem from the German text of the regulation because the other text of the regulation that I was able to look at, and I 
I am ashamed to admit that I did not, for example, look at the Hungarian text or the Lithuanian text. But the text that I was able to look at did seem to indicate that the German text was the odd one out. And perhaps the National Court would never have made a difference if the German case, if the German text had looked like the other texts. I'm also going to say, even if the words themselves are the right words, are they going to be understood to mean the same thing if they're held over by lawyers who come from vastly different legal traditions? Because the way that one reads a text is dependent really on one's legal culture. And my final point under this, guys, would be a personal experience of the last two, three months which arose from a very unusual set of circumstances. As the first advocate general, I had to deal with the problem that my Spanish colleague, advocate general Ricardo Colomer, had to take sick leave. And it happened that two of his cases were scheduled for hearing during the time that he was going to be away. And the president didn't want them to be held up because that would be bad for statistics. And so somebody had to take over the cases, and I couldn't really give them to one of my other colleagues, so I took over both cases myself. And then I had a sort of discussion, which is, seems completely surreal, but you do have it sometimes at the ETJ. I took over, with the case, the nice judicial assistant, the referendum, who had been working on the case up to that point. And in each case, two different referendum, in each case, our first meeting, consisted of a negotiation about what the language was we were going to try and write the opinion in. Was it better to ask a Spanish lawyer who was used to writing in Spanish and working from French and who was perfectly happy about talking and reading English but possibly rather less comfortable about writing it, was the right thing to ask the referendum to try to write an opinion in English and then I would rewrite it so that it sounded like me? Or was it better to get Referendum to write in Spanish, as he normally would, and then we would discuss the draft opinion in a mixture of English, French, and Spanish, and the original language would be the Spanish, but I would obviously check both the French, as I always do, but also the English translation when that came through, so that it sounded right. And I suspect partly because I did spend a year here in Cambridge doing modern languages, and I think Spanish is a very beautiful language and I don't get the chance to practice it very often, I opted for the wheel writing in Spanish solution. And I was richly paid out for my errors. <laughs> With the first one of these two cases, I began to realize the problem <coughs> because we had carefully written Spanish that was almost rude in Spanish. It was so direct. It certainly was not the type of Spanish that Advocate General Ricardo Colomer would ever have allowed to go out over his name. It was not sufficiently Baroque. <laughs> but when we put it into English, I sounded, well, actually rather shifty. <laughs> because it wasn't very direct. In fact, it wasn't anything like as direct as my normal writing style in English is. Um, then I had to do something to the English without violating the Spanish in order to get the text to sound plausible in English. And the problem would have been much worse in Australian market in the second case because that was a grand shape case, much bigger, more elaborate. I tried to mitigate what I foresee, foresaw would be the damage by begging the head of English translation practically on my knees to let me have the very best English translator and reviser that I could lay our hands on. You know, fantastically good jurist and obese. But the very remarkable was an opinion that in draft form was a hundred pages long. And I have on and off, I wouldn't like to think how long, spent how long over the last few weeks trying to line up the Spanish original, the English non-original, but that's what's going to be read, and the French text, which is what the court's going to work from, so that they mean the same thing. And might they perhaps be the same length? Well, actually, they're not. 
you're curious, you can see that they're not the same length. And you can see that there are some phrases which you don't find in the English because you don't need when you're citing legislation in English to say, article so and so, you just say article so and so. But it was an enormously instructive procedure, as well as very time consuming, and it left me with the unshakable conviction that the genius of different languages is different. And that if it was impossible for an adequate general with all the quality resources of the court and vast amounts of time and support to arrive at texts that were exactly the same in three languages, that arriving at a legal text that is exactly the same in 27 languages on a recurring routine basis is a very tall order indeed. Let me bring this to a close. The reality of the EU that we live in and are trying to build together is that a number of the features that I would say make it a great and worthwhile endeavour, in particular its linguistic and cultural and juridical diversity, a number of those features are precisely features that militate against clear legal language and against clear interpretative readings from UCJ. And the challenge that we face is how to minimize the problems and misunderstandings that arise from lack of legal transparency. As I think I may have indicated, I do not believe it would be utopian to maintain that we can eliminate all of these altogether. But I do think that we can, and that we should, try to reduce the frequency with which linguistic imperfection causes <coughs> real difficulties. Now, in this lecture, I have tried to highlight some of the factors that cause difficulties. Many of them, in my view, are not insuperable obstacles. With understanding, with patience, and let's be frank, a lot of plain hard work, I think we can and we should do significantly better.